Okay, thank you. So, um, as mentioned, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, my work in Ecuador in relation to um, both indigenous knowledge or, or traditional knowledge. Obviously, the terms have some different meanings, but I'll use them interchangeably today. Uh, and then also how some of this relates to the Sustainable Development Goals. So in recent years, various United Nations programs have highlighted the importance of indigenous knowledge to the realization of certain sustainable development goals. This orientation is visible in the 2017 briefing note on indigenous people's rights and the 2030 agenda, which observes that traditional knowledge about nature and sustainable practices can contribute to achieving the SDGs related to environmental sustainability. The briefing note further suggests that indigenous knowledge could be integrated into formal education systems as a means to achieve SDG targets related to increasing awareness on lifestyles that operate in harmony with nature. The overt recognition by the United Nations of the importance of indigenous people's knowledge represents uh, an improvement over the older Millennium Development Goals where indigenous peoples were largely invisible. Nevertheless, in general, indigenous knowledge remains marginal to the SDGs. It is therefore unsurprising that one of the key suggestions for how to improve the 2030 agenda relates to the question about, of what to do about traditional knowledge. The United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues has specifically advocated for the protection and enhancement of traditional knowledge as a means to ensure that Indigenous peoples are not left behind in the 2030 agenda. However, at present there exists neither an international legal framework nor even a generalized consensus surrounding how to regulate traditional knowledge. That is not to say that the international legal community has ignored calls for the protection and enhancement of indigenous knowledge. Uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, has enthusiastically embraced traditional knowledge as another form of intellectual property. According to WIPO, the, tradition, the protection of traditional knowledge quote, can mean recognizing and exercising exclusive rights or non-proprietary forms of protection like moral rights, equitable compensation schemes, and protection against unfair competition. In other words, the framework that WIPO envisages to govern uses of indigenous knowledge would import concepts from conventional intellectual property regimes, such as exclusive rights from patents, moral rights from copyright, as well as other established legal paradigms. WIPO has sought to embody this conceptualization in law through its Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore, which for years has attempted to create an international legal instrument for the protection of traditional knowledge. And this is an image from the most recent meeting of this committee in uh, August of 2018. So uh, you can get a sense for how some of, this, some of these dialogues are occurring at the international level. Um, in some ways very similar to a lot of UN uh, type fora, but uh, clearly a bit distanced from a lot of actual indigenous experience, um, as I'll talk about in just a moment as well. Uh, so uh, despite these efforts, at present uh, no such global framework exists for the protection of traditional knowledge, but this process may be culminating. The Intergovernmental Committee has announced that a draft treaty should be finalized by 2020. Um, however, the formation of this prospective regime has been fraught, and the viability of the voluntary fund that finances the participation of indigenous peoples in the negotiations has been jeopardized on several occasions. And if you see on, for example, the Twitter feed of WIPO, uh, during these meetings, you can see images of all the participants, and they were mostly representatives of state agencies and not indigenous communities. So in the absence of a multilateral treaty, certain regional intergovernmental organizations have created frameworks for the governance of traditional knowledge, usually according to similarly proprietary logics. These include the Secretariat of the Pacific Community with its regional framework for the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture, and the Swakopmund Protocol of the African Intellectual Property Organization. At the national level, some countries have enacted laws to protect indigenous knowledge based on two general models. The first of these typically involves the compilation of a state-administered database, which can be used to defeat applications for conventional forms of intellectual property based on lack of novelty. WIPO classifies these repositories as mechanisms for defensive protection. 
Meanwhile, WIPO characterizes the second general model as one that offers positive protection. These systems are designed to prevent the unauthorized use of traditional knowledge, as well as potentially to promote the commercial exploitation of such knowledge by legitimate possessors. Among the few territories to have experimented with a more nuanced approach to the governance of traditional knowledge is Ecuador. Uh, so uh, I chose this image here, uh, which I took myself during some field work in 2016, um, as representative of the, the title of my talk and some of what the Ecuadorian government has been attempting to achieve, which is this concept of the dialogue of knowledges or the Dialogo de Saberes, which basically means that um, there's conceived of as a parity between um, scientific knowledge, modern scientific knowledge, and traditional knowledge. And I thought this image was interesting to, to illustrate that because you can see here uh, several members of a Quechua community in, in the Imbabora province in northern Ecuador uh, who are participating in a, an Easter celebration, a procession, where uh, you can also see images of Jesus and, and the cross. And so this illustrates the syncretism and the constantly uh, evolving uh, properties of a lot of indigenous experience. Uh, so uh, in December 2016, Ecuador enacted a comprehensive new framework for intellectual property, which is colloquially known as the Ingenios Act. And this law was created through a participatory process, uh, which, for example, included pre-legislative consultations in the National Assembly. Um, and here we see members of uh, a variety of different Ecuadorian indigenous communities and nationalities who are participating in the formation of this law. Um, so the law itself covers all conventional forms of intellectual property, uh, including patents, copyright, trademarks, as well as a system of traditional knowledge protection. However, the Ingenios Act does not cast indigenous knowledge in explicitly proprietary terms. Instead, the law regulates standard intellectual property categories on one hand and traditional knowledge on the other according to the common notion of intellectual rights. Thus, the Ingenios Act recognizes intellectual property and indigenous people's knowledge as co-equal systems for the management of different ways of knowing. Under the Ecuadorian regime, both should be protected in furtherance of, quote, protecting or rather promoting scientific, technological, artistic, and cultural development, as well as incentivizing innovation, end quote. Therefore, while the invocation of the term traditional knowledge may, su may suggest an historical rather than modern rendering of indigenous wisdom and technologies, the Ingenios Act recognizes that such knowledge holds continued contemporary relevance for Ecuadorian society. The appreciation of traditional knowledge as dynamic, vital, and constantly evolving is further evidenced in the framing language of the Ingenios Act. Here, the law references the Ecuadorian 2008 Constitution, which, quote, foresees that it shall be the responsibility of the state to facilitate and promote the incorporation of the society of knowledge to achieve the objectives of the development regime, promote the generation and production of knowledge, foment scientific and technological research, and strengthen traditional knowledge, end quote. Um, and these are some of the categories uh, or the different types of knowledge that are conceptualized as indigenous or traditional. And you can see it's very broad, uh, really covers all different types of uh, subject matter and um, skills, concepts, and ways of knowing. Uh, in addition to the protection and um, the fostering of development of traditional knowledge, the objectives of the Ingenios Act also include to rescue ancestral knowledge which implies that certain forms of knowledge have been lost or at least obfuscated or subjugated, but that such ways of knowing will be important for the actualization of the country's new development regime. The current Ecuadorian strategy for national development in many ways echoes the sustainable development goals. The country's development plan endeavors to realign the national economic objectives according to principles derived from the indigenous Andean concept of buen vivir which the government has widely appropriated in recent years. According to the current Ecuadorian development plan, buen vivir may be understood as, quote, the form of life that allows for happiness and the permanence of cultural and environmental diversity. It is harmony, equality, equity, and solidarity. It is not to seek opulence or economic growth, end quote. Under this paradigm, the Ingenios Act announces the intention to reimagine the role that intellectual property plays in development. <clears throat> 
Although governments have long championed intellectual property as a tool for development, the Ingenio system in some ways departs from this narrative. Specifically, development in the Ingenio's context is said to mean something other than simply the accumulation of wealth. Therefore, indigenous ways of knowing may attain renewed value, and accordingly, the Ingenios Act takes the protection of traditional knowledge seriously. While this in itself is significant, the Ingenio system for the governance of traditional knowledge is noteworthy for several additional reasons. First, the Ingenios Act conceives of rights over traditional knowledge as collective, pertaining to legitimate possessors, not to owners. In remaining faithful to the Ecuadorian constitutional objective of plurinationality, traditional knowledge protections are to be realized, quote, in accordance with legitimate possessors' own customs, institutions, and cultural practices, contributing to the strengthening of their traditional internal structures, end quote. This formulation is supposed to conform to the to indigenous in Andean understandings of the relationship between individuals and their intellectual productions. Second, the Ingenios regime does not operate solely as a defensive mechanism that would provide an instrument to challenge the novelty of applications for conventional forms of intellectual property. Instead, con uh, collective rights over traditional knowledge are recognized as imprescriptible, inalienable, and inviolable. Decision-making surrounding the uses of protected subject matter is enshrined as a right of free determination to be realized according to legitimate possessors, quote, own forms of conviviality, social organization, institutions, and the generation and exercise of authority, end quote. The Ingenios Act therefore provides what WIPO would characterize as a form of positive protection for traditional knowledge, the parameters of which are intended to be consonant with local indigenous customary law. In contrast to systems for traditional knowledge protection that some other countries have enacted, under the Ingenios Act, the recognition of the collective rights of legitimate possessors over their traditional knowledge is not subject to any formality or registration for the effects of guaranteeing, guaranteeing uh, protection. A recently published set of draft regulations to the Ingenios Law substantiate this provision by recognizing parallel systems of protection for traditional knowledge, which are comprised of a state-run database, deposit and registry on the one hand, and on the other, community registries administered according to customary law. The draft regulations further stipulate that community registries should be based on locally developed procedures for registration of traditional knowledge according to customary norms and in the native language of the community. While the Ingenio system operates to empower communities to manage their knowledge according to their own terms, the regime also situates the state as the central archivist, intermediary, and enforcer of Ecuadorian traditional knowledge. And we can see an example of that here in, um, in the state's role, that is, in this guide that the Ecuadorian Intellectual Property Institute has developed which is essentially a manual for how to protect traditional knowledge. So legitimate possessors in Ecuador are under no obligation to register their knowledge to be protected, but the Ingenio Act does create a mechanism through which the government will administer a confidential and non-public registry. According to this scheme, legitimate possessors may deposit their traditional knowledge in an official archive if they so desire. The state of objective of this registry is to avoid misappropriation, as well as to serve as a record of prior art. And uh, we can see here, this registry is actually, um, it contains an online tool for the registration of traditional knowledge. So we can see how some of this uh, has also been appropriated and inscribed by the state um, through an apparatus that's really quite accessible on the one hand because it's published online and anyone can access it, but on the other hand is a bit, uh, a maybe a bit difficult to access for members of certain indigenous communities in the country. So although registration is voluntary, it is notable that in order to re uh, receive protection under the Ingenios Act, traditional knowledge must be made le legible in new ways to the centralized Ecuadorian governmental apparatus. For example, according to the system proposed in the draft regulations, local custodians would be obliged or would be obligated, rather, to submit an annual report to the National Service for Intellectual Rights that would detail the number of traditional knowledge registrations made and the security measures employed to protect this subject matter. It is also notable that the National, System, National Service for Intellectual Rights would constitute the entity responsible for undertaking, quote, 
permanent monitoring of the collective rights of legitimate possessors, end quote, for the purpose of preventing improper access, use, or utilization of traditional knowledge. Overall, the system for the protection of indigenous knowledge imagined in the Ingenios Act may in some ways empower marginalized peoples and their ways of knowing the world. However, the transformation of culturalized communities into subjects of neoliberal government could entail unintended consequences. For instance, Coombe has argued that concomitant with the extension of a rights-based framework to protect traditional knowledge, indigenous communities are increasingly configured in politicized economic terms as holders of collective properties that they are, uh, quote, encouraged to culturalize. This has occurred in Ecuador in part through the incorporation of protections for traditional knowledge into the Ingenios Act. Even if not expressly conceptualized as intellectual property, the doctrinal linkage of indi indigenous knowledge protections with the copyright, patent, and trademark regimes may also have the effect of translating the contents of traditional knowledge into neoliberal logics. Thus, the Ingenio system may be understood as a new governmental technology through which in indigenous and other subaltern groups are encouraged to represent themselves as collective subjects bearing distinctive cultures and safeguarding valuable diversity. In this context, the protection of traditional knowledge may extend novel opportunities to historically marginalized peoples, for instance, through greater political participation or economic access. Yet doing so could also serve to make these groups politically and economically legible to different actors, while also reifying social imaginaries that presume the existence of unified communities that receive uniform benefits from the exploitation of their cultural goods. These criticisms in many ways mirror the challenges of incorporating indigenous knowledge into the 2030 agenda. To some scholars, the notion of, quote, sustainable development is an oxymoron, end quote. Specifically, even where the 2030 agenda may be understood as a more equitable system in social, cultural, and environmental terms as compared to the neoliberal economic model, it continues to operate according to the logics of development. In contrast, as Kothari et al. note, in indigenous knowledge, there is nothing analogous to the concept of development. There is no concept of a linear process of life to establish a before and after state, namely under development and development. Thus, it may, be it may be possible to embody a culturalized form of traditional knowledge in the 2030 agenda and to protect such knowledge according to the rationality of possession or property. Yet doing so could risk further diluting indigenous ways of understanding the world that operate as real alternatives to the dominant system for global governance. Thank you.